Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Contemplating Christian, and today we have a pretty awesome topic. We are going to be talking about G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, and also George MacDonald. So um, pretty much that whole group of writers that really influenced fantasy writing, imagination, uh, fiction, fairy tales, all that stuff. And we're going to talk about their philosophy and ideas behind the use of fairy tales. Okay. Um, and the first article, well, we have two articles that are kind of going to help us out here. We aren't going to just uh, just use those. We're going to give our own dies, ideas. But the first article is going to focus specifically on G.K. Chesterton, Lewis, and Tolkien. And then the second is actually an essay by George MacDonald. So uh, the the second half of this, this podcast will really focus on MacDonald's ideas. If you don't know who George MacDonald did, is he is C.S. Lewis's self-proclaimed uh, mentor. Uh, even though they weren't necessarily contemporaries, uh, C.S. Lewis read a lot of his stuff and just considered him his master pretty much. So that's uh, th those are the four people we're going to be talking about. Um, do you have anything to say about any of those characters? Yeah. Uh, so if you have ever read The Great Divorce, uh, that's C.S. Lewis's great work where he talks about this journey from um, heaven, hell. It's sort of a interesting afterlife story, and it's debated about what exactly is going on in The Great Divorce. But um, George MacDonald is the character that guides C.S. Lewis along like the angel in Paradise Lost. Or, sorry, not Paradise Lost, uh, Dante's Inferno. Yeah. <laughs> There's an angel that guides him around uh, purgatory and heaven and hell. And um, Lewis is kind of riffing off that story with the great divorce. And he has George MacDonald as like a, a friend that guides him along through the whole story. So just a, a cool connection there for C.S. Lewis fans. Yeah. that And a great book. If you haven't read the great divorce, definitely read it. Also Dante's Inferno. But if you want the easier read, do the great divorce. Yeah, definitely. Um, easier. <laughs> yeah, but those are those are the characters and all of them pretty much influenced each other. MacDonald influenced Lewis, uh, Lewis and Tolkien influenced each other and Chesterton influenced Lewis and Tolkien. I'm not sure if there's any connection between Chesterton and MacDonald, but those are, uh, those are the connections right there, but we can yeah. get, uh, straight into it and we'll talk about some Chestertonian fantasy. So the first, uh, the first point we would like to make when it comes to fantasy is that it's actually a means uh, so one, it's a means of recovery and renewal when we read uh, kind of fantastic things. And then we also have a connection between uh, Chesterton and Lewis and, and Tolkien just as a, one example of how he influenced them. Uh, so, uh, for example, he actually writes about tradition and then he then the writer of this article points out how Chesterton's writing on tradition actually influenced Narnia and Middle Earth and Narnia and Middle Earth both participated in tradition as well and uh, were influenced by tradition. And there's that whole idea of tradition right there. And that's just one example of how Chesterton influenced Lewis and Tolkien's writings. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but with fantasy as renewal, we could, Kind of think of it as our spirits or our mentality being rejuvenated because as we'll get into later it's it's not what people actually think it's not just us avoiding our problems and escaping uh from the real world or something it's actually us interacting with truth and mm -hmm. reality in a very pure form um mm -hmm. so it's actually a good thing yeah so what yeah, do you got all these writers talk about they would all agree with the statement that like reading fantasy or reading fairy tales is not escaping from reality it's escaping to reality uh, which is the point you're getting at and mm -hmm. all all four of these guys would say something to the effect that in some sense fairy tales or our imagination or fairy stories are more real than reality or they're more real than our perception of the real world in some sense and they all talk about this 
And I think that to kind of reflect on why that is or why these writers who are so influential believe that and they resonate with people. I think one reason that I've kind of been thinking about is that fairy stories or fantasy, we'll just say fantasy, um, it illumines good and evil more clearly sometimes than reality illumines those things. So like mm -hmm. I think about how people who reflect on Lord of the Rings will say that the good characters are like the best characters I've ever seen. And the evil characters are the worst characters I've ever seen. It like, it brings a precision and clarity to good and evil in a way that sometimes our real world doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one reason I think maybe they're, they're wanting to get at this idea that fantasy is more real than reality in some sense. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, kids, <clears throat> Who do they look up to? They obviously have people close to them that they look up to, but a lot of times they pick a fictional character and they're like, I love this person. Right. And right. it's like their whole life. So like my nephew obsessed with the flash for like five years. That's all he ever talked about. There's a reason for that. He was a, he was a hero and an amazing character. All right. Um, but you, you are a hundred percent right. They would actually say it's more real. And we actually have a quick quote from, gk chesterton he actually calls fairy tales the sunny land of common sense as in uh like you said it, it kind of takes good and evil and just makes it so real so believable like everyone should know this uh but here's a quote the things i believed most then the things i believe most now are the things called fairy tales they seem to me to be the entirely reasonable thing fairy Fairyland is nothing but the sunny country of common sense. It is not earth that judges heaven, but heaven that judges earth. So for me, at least, it was not earth that criticized Elfland, but Elfland that criticized the earth. So the, uh, the heavenly things or the way things should be were criticizing what was actually happening on earth. And... Um, all the writers right there would actually believe that. So, uh, yeah. What do you, what do you think about, uh, that quote right there? Yeah. It's, uh, we've talked a lot about like the transcendentals of good truthness, <laughs> good truthness, goodness, truth, <laughs> truthness, goodness, <laughs> truth, and beauty. And, um, those are, they're kind of putting fantasy as, kind of putting all of that into that camp of the transcendentals and saying like they access those things in a very clear way mm -hmm. and they are uh, kind of windows into that reality into goodness, truth, and beauty in a way that um, shows that more clearly. And so in that way, they are very, very real and they mm -hmm. help us see reality more clearly and they're um, commonsensical in that way. Yeah. Um, and they actually theologized, if that's even a word, I don't know. I'm using it though. Theologized <clears throat> fairy tales, as in they made it part of their theology or used it in theology. So, uh, for example, G.K. Chesterton wrote a book called Orthodoxy. This is where that quote is from on, I think it's chapter four, Ethics of the Elfland. And mm -hmm. he's he's talking about, well, ob obviously Orthodoxy, but he, he was clearly talking about Christian and religious things throughout this, uh, throughout this whole thing. But ethics of Elfland is just about like fairy tales. And a lot of people, if we, if we were to grab a theology book, a lot of people might, <laughs> might just be like, what, what the heck is this chapter? It seems kind of like the odd one out or something like that. It's just a, a random chapter on fairy tales. Um, but they actually made it part of their theology. So like Lewis said, would, would say that all myths and, Good stories point to Jesus. Tolkien said something similar, but they all obviously had that connection right there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's a good thing to point out. And uh, <clears throat> so when it comes to the Christian worldview and the atheistic worldview and fairy tales, there's uh, there's actually an analogy all of them pretty much used. I don't know if McDonald used it, but. Chesterton, I'm pretty sure used it. And then Tolkien and Lewis definitely used it. Um, mm -hmm. The prison, right? Materialism is a prison. And if we think about fairy tales or fantasy or supernatural things, that's us escaping to the true reality, as we mentioned a little bit before. So um, 
yeah, when it, when it comes to <clears throat> fairy tales pointing to the true reality, there's that connect. We like materialists and atheists are trying to imprison us in this little box and we just want to go beyond that. Yeah. yeah. And I think to bring it more into theology too, you can think of like, where do we get our imagination from? I think that that sort of can, if you're, if you're not really tracking with where these guys are thinking and how this relates to Christianity, think about where our imagination comes from. Is that something that's part of the image of God in us? And I think a lot of the, these authors would argue, yes, it is that, um, that Tolkien has this idea of sub creation, that we are mm -hmm. sub creators because we were created by the creator or the artist or the storyteller, mm -hmm. capital, capital a artist, capital S storyteller. And, um, because of that, we have this innate sense and desire and capacity to create, uh, and to create stories of our own. Mm -hmm. And I think that that will start to get the wheels turning as to how this all relates to Christianity and God and why these authors, um, had their faith influence their fantasy so much and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so <clears throat> As, as we move towards the McDonald essay, uh, that's the first thing he gets into. Um, mm -hmm. there, there is one more thing I, I would like to talk about when it comes to uh, Chesterton and Tolkien and Lewis before we hit McDonald, though, and uh, creation kind of mimicking God. And that's kind of what we do when we make fairy tales in other worlds. But the, the last point is that magic has meaning, right? the these fantasy things have meaning um and we we can find some very comforting I ideas in there and so the the example that is used is actually from lord of the rings best story ever um but here it is it's by gandalf when he's talking to frodo um there was something else at work beyond any design of the ring maker i can but uh put it no plainer than by saying that bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker in which case you were meant to have it and that may be an encouraging thought um so that ring this magic parts this magic element of that world that was created to the world of lord of the rings it um it imbued everything with meaning as in it gave Bilbo and Frodo, a purpose. It might not be the only purpose they had, but it was purpose that they were given. And that was done through magic and fantastic things, not through normal and like ordinary things. So obviously, yeah. um, uh, like Bilbo and Frodo gardening, that didn't give them purpose in the story. That It just didn't, because all, all the hobbits gardened and a lot of people gardened. But... It was the magical thing that gave the purpose. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, he's getting at this point that all the characters in Lord of the Rings, it's its very clear throughout the story, uh, like I think multiple times with Gandalf and Aragorn, they they speak of this, um, like this, this sense of being guided and the sense of purpose behind all of the events that are happening. And they're basically just describing the providence of God directing the whole story, but it's sort of undercover. And it's just hinted at, um, but it's very clear in some of these quotes that they're referring to this designer that's guiding the whole process. And I think you can argue rightly, and Tolkien would say the same thing, that the hero of the story is God's providence, basically, that um, in Lord of the Rings, you have at the end of it, not Frodo that is the hero, but because Gollum happened to still be there and happened to still be alive, that he knocked the ring off the mountain and all that stuff. Um, that all happened kind of by happenstance and it's by kind of God's guiding providence that those things occurred rather than mm -hmm. like one hero actually conquering evil and stuff like that. It's really the providence of God. Yeah. Um, that's actually a really good point. So that, that's actually another way it connects to theology right there. So it's, uh, it all connects very, very well. And if, if someone wanted a, a series on kind of, how all that connects specifically in Lewis and Tolkien. Ryan Reeves, he's awesome. He has a whole lecture series on Lewis and Tolkien, their <clears throat> their backgrounds, their their stories, and also their beliefs. So mm -hmm. highly recommend that YouTube series right there. But yeah. um, 
yeah, anyway, let's uh, let's continue on into the point that you made a little bit ago, just a couple of minutes ago on create like why we create stories. So Tolkien did definitely talk about this. He says we create because we were created. Um, mm-hmm. And this is where McDonald starts off with his writing on the imagination and fairy tales. Uh, now, the first couple of paragraphs of the essay are kind of um, just about like the word fairy tale and stuff like that. But then he goes into we create worlds with laws, right? And he actually focuses on law quite a bit. We might think of law with in a negative sense, like something went wrong and now we need law or something like that. But he actually says laws help the stories function. Um, as in stories and fairy tales are the closest we come to creation, but beauty is like law is where beauty grows from, basically. So we uh, we must create these laws and we can't break them or else it kind of ruins the story, right? Yeah. Yeah, for any good story, there needs to be, yeah, like you said, this connection to law and all these fairy tales, even though they're fantastical and imaginative, they function according to laws and the writers mm-hmm. have to obey laws in a sense for the stories to actually work. And I think mm-hmm. about how he talks about like the moral law is never messed with in fantasy. It is always, nobody writes a good story in which uh, the hero like murders children because that would never be a good story and no one would ever read that. It resonates with the reality of morality and goodness and beauty. Um, Mm -hmm. Fairy tales mimic that and they, they display it more clearly. So yeah, fairy tales operate according to laws. Yeah. They do. And <clears throat> our mind also flourishes in law. So like, for for example, I um, just any any movies we've watched recently, we uh, we like them, but nobody likes a plot hole or a contradiction that like later in the story happens where you're like, wait, something happened earlier where now this doesn't make sense. I don't like this anymore. Right. Uh, like, I, I've definitely felt that way with a couple of Star Wars movies. Love Star Wars, especially the original trilogy, but I felt that way with a couple of things. So, um, yeah, but no one no one likes it when the laws of the story are broken. But you're also right. Mm-hmm. The, the, the caveat to this whole thing is the one, the one time where we don't create our own laws, we also don't change the laws, we don't uh, do any of that is the moral law in the stories. Mm-hmm. But... Yeah, this is, uh, he, uh, I actually want to read a quote from the essay in which he describes how everything flourishes in law. Uh, mm-hmm. So it says, law is the soil in which alone beauty will grow. Beauty is the only stuff in which truth can be clothed. And then he goes on to describe how the imagination is the tailor uh, and our fancy or what we like kind of puts all the pieces together. And I just thought that it was a really good illustration for how we write stories and communicate stories because it's true. That's what we do. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that's good. But yeah. Yeah. Do you have, well, do you have any thoughts on that or, uh, I was kind of going back to this idea of, um, yes. So like, well, it seems like in all these authors, they're connecting, uh, goodness, truth, and beauty very like, intimately like they're the same reality and that is Mm. like the the truth of the transcendentals is that they all are actually describing one one thing which is like the one divine reality or god and then goodness Mm -hmm. truth and beauty are sort of reflections of that same one thing um yeah so this just reminds me of this interplay between beauty can come from truth and law um Mm. what what was the quote again beauty the rich soil of okay yeah so from law yeah, so law is the soil in which alone beauty will grow. Right. And then beauty clothes truth. So if we're talking about the transcendentals, I mean, that's how people would describe it, though, with goodness, truth, yeah. and beauty. They would say uh, truth is the most essential because everything else depends on it. So if something is beautiful, we have to ask, oh, is it true that it's beautiful or something like that? So when it comes to that, the um, <clears throat> here, one sec. Um, he actually 
did bring this up. He talked about it. He said, beauty is plainer, but truth is more essential. Mm-hmm. As in when, when we have these stories, they are powerful. And that's mainly because of their beauty, because that's just boom, plain to see. But underneath the beauty, we do actually have to have truthful things, whether it be good things or just true statements um, right. and written from the correct worldview. Um, because without truth and goodness, beauty could not exist. Actually, a lot of people think that beauty, in a sense, is truth and goodness kind of put together in a way. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's one view of it, but I know that's debated. Sure. Yeah. So, but, yeah, you go. No, this is good. Um, I think uh, I like kind of moving from this how uh, this kind of mixes the two articles together a little bit, but this idea that. Uh, fairy tales, you have to kind of approach them with a sense of humility. So mm-hmm. as, a, as like an adult, you will always kind of, if you're prideful, you always just kind of will scoff at a fairy tale mm-hmm. and will think that you're better than it. And you're think, you're, you will think that there's nothing to be gleaned from it. This is for children. Mm-hmm. And I think that that shows how these authors are great is that they are, they write with a sense of humility yeah. and wonder at the world. So they look at the world around them and they are struck by the wonder of it and the joy of it. And they're, they have gratitude and they're thankful. Mm -hmm. And this all merges into their writing and this, their, their light, their love for fairy tales. And when you actually, as an adult, it takes like a humility. It takes coming to the story like a child to actually be able to understand it and to glean from it. Uh, I love how Chesterton talks about like, is not my arms and legs a birthday present. Yeah. Like (laughs) he talks about like in this world right now, I should be grateful for everything. Everything I have is a gift. I didn't make myself. And Mm -hmm. it's just this, this root gratitude that he has about everything, which makes his writing very joyous to read. Um, That materialism, like there's no one to thank. There's no gratitude is sort of incoherent. And I think these all these ideas of fairy tales and humility are kind of work together. Yeah. The, um, <clears throat> I would say they're the true romantics. Like I, w- I would say actual romanticism is a, is a fraud, but these guys are the true romantics there. Uh, as some people put it for specifically Lewis romantic rationalists, they, mm. uh, they like beautiful things, but the, they know that it clothes truth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, <clears throat> you were talking about, um, let's see, like wonder and childlikeness. And I think it was McDonald that says this, but he says he doesn't write fairy tales for children. He writes them for the childlike. That's what yeah. he says, which I think that's the big point right here when, uh, when it comes to us. Obviously, we can write everything, but our attitude, our posture towards it should be a childlike attitude, one of wonder. Um, because if we, if we didn't have that, it wouldn't work. We, <laughs> we would write boring and probably super dumb stories <laughs> um, right. if we didn't approach it from a childlike view or a wondrous view. If, right. if, if our story isn't wondrous, it's going to just be the opposite, not wondrous. It's going to be boring. Right. And you can see here, like the biblical connections too. Of um, the, Jesus talks about how the, the kingdom is for basically children, people who are childlike. We're called children uh-huh. of God. And if you hear that and you immediately go, "I'm not a child. I'm better than that." <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that kind of shows your place with God is that you you aren't willing to to submit to that sort of caricature or character of being a child. And faith mm-hmm. and humility kind of go together. Yeah. And ch- yeah. childlikeness kind of embodies yeah, faith and humility. And so, yeah, there is definitely yeah. a connection between like people of faith and their love for fairy tales. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And the, um, and the wonder that is part of our stories and the truth and the beauty part of our stories, it's powerful force and it should wake things up in people. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then, well, McDonald gets into like an interesting uh, topic when he brings that up because uh, he's like, people could object and say like, what if it wakes something up bad? Or what if uh, 
What if people then decide for it to mean something it didn't intend to mean or, or, or something like that? Um, and we would say that sometimes that's okay for us to let the story do more work. Uh, uh, like here, here's one way it was put. It's God's work cannot mean more than he intended. Man's work must mean more than he intended. So when it comes to fairy tales and like subjectivism and people saying, oh, this means this to me. And that's, that's the actual meaning. Well, first thing, the story is going to point to what's actually true and what's actually beautiful. But uh, a human being doesn't have their m mind complete enough to write an entire story and figure out everything it's supposed to mean. It's probably right. going to have something unintended happen, whether it be good or bad, because right. <laughs> no, one, no one can comprehend a story that much to where they're like, yeah, this is every single meaning and every single idea that's going to come out of this. Right. Uh, right. Th there's no way. Right. And so this is like a, a distinction can be made between like subjectivism on the one hand and then imagination. So subjectivism, we often think, especially as Christians, is that not being a good thing. Um, mm. It's sort of a, a bad thing of our time that people don't believe in objective truth. And so they just make meaning for themselves. And we mm. want to distinguish imagination from that. Imagination yeah. is different. Imagination sees all of the depths and layers of meaning that are in something that's actually connecting with the truth of reality. Whereas the author can maybe um, paint a painting of a country landscape with a horse and farm and all this stuff. And it's a beautiful painting and uh, many people can get different things from that. And that is tapping more into imagination, not subjectivism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because there's depth and meaning to the artwork. It's not that there's no objective truth. Yeah. So that's a, an important distinction that the McDonald article is kind of teasing out. Yeah. And nothing worthwhile wakes only one thought. It's not like I'm going to write a whole book and someone's going to read it and just have one singular thought. That's no, that would be, that'd be stupid. Um, and sure. also, uh, he, he gets at this kind of funny point of, I wouldn't write down the meaning afterwards. I wouldn't like write a paragraph in a story. Then in the footnotes be like, this means this. Um, and he right. says, uh, an artist wouldn't draw a horse then under it. Right. This is a horse. <laughs> right. Right. Um, which I, I thought was kind of funny, but, uh, when, when it comes to waking things up and things it, like the stories being powerful, we can talk about the evangelism that stories can do. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I was listening to Bishop Barron on this, on Tolkien specifically, because he talked, he talks a lot about him or brings him up. Um, but he says he accidentally became like a great evangelist because he just like, smuggled the gospel into lord of the rings basically and no one knew it no one realized it and so you have all these secular people they're like lord of the rings is like the most legendary movie series and book series ever um books are better than movies by the way and <clears throat> and they don't like a lot of them don't even know that he was catholic mm -hmm. yeah right yeah i think you're right and it gets at this um it does smuggle in Christianity and it smuggles into it smuggles in the gospel and it taps into the desire for the gospel that everyone has the desire for goodness to beat truth or goodness mm -hmm. to beat evil the desire for um yeah the truth to win the desire for heroes to be vindicated and the hero uh, and all of that stuff um the reality of our human sinfulness when it's actually played out fairy tales mm -hmm. will like show show us ourselves in a unique way um like a mirror mm -hmm. uh and yeah it connects yeah. people to the gospel in ways that they don't anticipate and sort of like a back door and then they're surprised by it yeah and yeah kind of describes um, c.s lewis's conversion surprised by yeah. joy and um that's what happened to him oh yeah and um leading to the last kind of idea it's on this topic of evangelism and kind of affecting people and stories being forces at work. Um, we could say that uh, if someone does mishandle our story, let's say I wrote a story and someone mishandles it or got meaning out of it that I didn't intend or that isn't even good, right? What should we do? What should we do? Um, 
So one point is we shouldn't over intellectualize it and just like rip the story apart intellectually. Two, we should just let the stories do their work and their magic. And that's because, and I've heard Gavin Ortland say something like this, it's truth doesn't need us to defend it. And so similarly, McDonald says, if I have a, if I have a dog that can bark, I'm not going to sit up and bark for it. And I mean, we can make that analogy with our stories. The stories are, uh, we, we could say in a sense, living things They're they're there. People can just read them and figure it out for themselves, especially if someone makes a false claim about the story. Mm. Our stories are there for it to correct people. Like we, we don't need to bark for it. We could, but it's right. not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to, I think, kind of wrap up um, just this discussion on the value of these authors and their stories and just we just have an encouragement to everyone to to explore these authors to read more of Lewis and Chesterton and Tolkien and George MacDonald and they all kind of you'll notice a common thread between all of them and they hmm. just have very similar um, similar minds so they're they're coming from the same sort of place and position on these things similar thought and it's just rich stuff and I think it will uh, awaken uh, stories to you in a new way Oh yeah, and ultimately yeah. it will point you. I think we both agree that it will point you to the true story and the true myth, uh, the true reality that is the gospel and Christianity. Yeah, I would agree with that. So that's a good place to end, though. So thank you for listening. If you feel led to support us, the links are in the description. You can do Patreon. You can buy our merch. Uh, please like and subscribe if you did like the video. We, we appreciate any support. So yeah, thank you. God bless. God bless.